Inspiration for Teachers podcast, bringing you dynamic and inspirational educator interviews. Our fascinating guests share their professional challenges and creative resolutions for success. Discover their workable strategies, ideas, and resources to reach your educational goals. And now your host, Kelly Long. Thank you for downloading this episode of Inspiration for Teachers. I would like to welcome on the show today, David Rogers, and I've been longing to use one of David's own phrases to describe him, and that is that he is a pedagogic troublemaker, which I absolutely love, David. (laughs) (laughs) He's also an explorer, adventurer, author, and geek. So we do share a few things in common, and that is that I am definitely a geek when it comes to technology and exploring everything that is new. Sometimes I have to hold myself back. But I'd like to let you have the opportunity now, David, to introduce yourself to our listeners and let them get to know a little bit more about you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, so I'm um, David Rogers. I'm uh, currently an assistant head teacher in a Brighton comprehensive, and um, I've sort of got here really through uh, leading geography. And um, I'm a geography activist, um, if you like, in the Geographical Association. And bits and pieces like that and um really my my passions are for teaching and learning I've, I've got kind of an unshakable belief in the power of good teaching good learning and um my role is uh, very privileged because um it's all about developing teaching and learning um looking after sort of the people premium spend and generally trying to innovate while keeping costs down and uh and making an impact Now, that's a really big challenge, but it leads on very nicely to this next question that I've been asking of all of my guests recently on the show, David. That is to get to the heart of what teaching and learning is all about. And it's not just one thing, but in your opinion, what do you think the most powerful tool or strategy a teacher has in their toolkit to aid learning? Um, yeah, I think because I'm, I'm, I'm not um, a subscriber to the holy grail of teaching. I, I just don't think that that exists. Um, and teachers have a massive tool shed um, available to them. And to me, the biggest tool that a teacher really has is their own experience and their own professional decisions and, and what they're doing. And um, it's quite interesting, you know, in Lemoff, in, in Practice Perfect, there's a phrase kind of, you know, the most effective teachers are often those that get the mundane right and by that is kind of knowing their pupils and doing the chasing and making sure they've chosen the correct way of learning or the correct tool for that particular um, class and that group of students for the right time and you know and the people who spend the time kind of you know looking back over what the students have done and making sure that they have learnt what they were supposed to and they are closing the gaps and so for me really uh, it's the professionalism of the teacher and I think you know setting that free and giving uh, teachers confidence is one of the things I try to do because once that's there then I think truly amazing things can happen and it's really about simple effective things so you know just the other day it was just coming up with um, something in literacy where somebody had just sort of uh, taken a continent um, and they'd got a big a big sort of piece of writing out of out of um, a piece of Shakespeare about this continent and you know just made the point and the link that uh, Shakespeare never been to these places and yet he was able to write about them in the imagination and it was you could just see the students were sort of, you know a bit captured by that uh, and were quite interested with that. It is really interesting and I think you're right there's not just one thing that a teacher can use because I don't know whether you can remember back to uh, Jamie's dream school and do you remember Alvin Hall and he was teaching maths and he was really good at capturing those those pupils imagination from the outset and he wasn't doing anything particular with maths he was just trying to show to them different ways of thinking about it so I like your concept and I like the idea of setting the teacher free and I think we're going to delve into that a little bit later on in the show but let's move on to this next question and it's quite fitting for you David because you're a geography teacher so I'm going to put you right in the center of our educational campus right now and find out from you in 60 seconds if at all possible what excites you about teaching 
and also the flip side of that, what you'd most like to change? Um, what most excites me really is that I work with a lot of people who come in day in, day out and kind of get on with what needs to be done. And they do so without much fanfare and, you know, no recognition kind of far and wide and yet they still come in and they still come in even though you know they're tired and they're groggy and you know um, and they still treat young people with respect and they still come in with that passion to let young people do the best they can and that's what I admire really um, and that's what excites me about teaching and despite what everybody tells you and, and all the headlines there's still a lot of those people in teaching and they're still around basically and then the flip side is that you know education is a political football and I kind of get that and that's fine however teachers are, are professionals and we're going to do the right thing and you know personally if there was a moratorium on uh, top-down curriculum change that would be the thing that's missing from the system at the moment because this is constant tinkering and a change in the goalposts which increases workload and it's quite ironic um, and I know it's political at the moment but it's quite ironic that you know just before um, Parliament broke you know Nicky Morgan's going on about I'm really concerned about workload when it's the government that are kind of responsible for most of that workload because we're having to rewrite a whole curriculum right the way from you know cradle to um, to when they leave so it's kind of that's what I would change and I was just saying right this is what you've got to teach that's crack on. It's always changing though, isn't it? Because I remember back when we spent a lot of time investing in the diplomas, which was under Labour, and we, you know, people wrote whole specifications and, you know, we were beginning to roll it out. And then as soon as we started rolling out, there was then the changing government and then that was all scrapped. And then we started again rewriting more specifications. And it's like, let us just not necessarily plateau, but let us develop what is good and what we can do well and stop tinkering around with it because by the time we've all caught up to where they want us to be it changes again yeah absolutely and and that's kind of you know that that's the thing and curriculum change is great because that excites me because it's about me learning something new and and you know geography and every other subject shouldn't be fossilized you know it shouldn't just stay still because what kind of engaged the professional and you know I'm a geographer first and then I'm a teacher and so I want to be learning about the latest stuff in geography uh, and the latest stuff in, in kind of English but you know I really do think that you know I welcome the new national curriculum to be honest and I've spoken quite a lot about it at the Geographical Association and Royal Geographical Society and things is that kind of there is no prescription you know, we're said, we're told you've got to teach glaciation and the key processes of glaciation, but we're not told what those are. And that's quite exciting. The fear is that, you know, teachers haven't been given that freedom for far too long. And I think they've forgotten that we can make decisions on what to teach. And I have lots of conversations which make me sad. That is all based around, you know, well, we're here really just to deliver a curriculum. We're here just to decide how to teach it and so well we're not we're here to create the curriculum and we're here to create that learning and we're there to decide what young people need to help them out because the thing is is that you know the knowledge and the skills that's kind of important but we need to be teaching those these children to use a cliche you know we need to be teaching them to know uh, what to do when they don't know what to do and that's the key thing um you know that i think we need to instill so what we're going to do now then, David, is we're going to move on to an area of the show where we get to explore an educational challenge that you have faced and one that allows us to look at some tough decisions that perhaps schools are, are facing at the moment. And that was to do with bringing your own device. That's one area that we're looking at today. So please, can you just outline for our listeners what those challenges are and, and what you have done to resolve those challenges for us? I think that the key challenge, um, which is very topical at the moment, is is kind of funding, um, which leads into sort of bring your own device and so on. And, you know, it's that challenge. I think that the, the argument of whether technology is useful in learning has long been won. And I think, you know, that although there still are people out there, I don't think you have to use technology. But I think, you know, in this day and age, um, it's a no brainer, really. That's been one. So then the question becomes, well, how do you do that? And how do you do that without 
adding more cost and more burden either onto parents or onto a school because part of me is like I think it's morally wrong to expect parents to you know pay more for education when they're coming to um to state schools um and the thing is with, with bring your own device is that there's a big kind of thought that you know it has to be a specific device and it has to do uh, certain things and really it's not about the device it's about the behaviors around the device and the um, learning behaviors and how the digital literacy is kind of um, tackled and held um, and so I think people can get distracted and you get tied into one ecosystem and the danger of that is is that it's very inflexible and then you're committed and you've got to go down that line really um, and my view has always been you know, I use things that are, are freely available, not necessarily free, because I think if you don't pay for anything, then you can't expect that to stay there. And I think staff that are less confident with technology tend to lose their way a little bit. And it's about using things that we already have. But also th these sort of apps or, or websites, they need to be sort of cross platform and they need to actually add some real value to the learning. Uh, and so that's those are the reasons why sort of BYOD really uh, for me is is kind of one of the ways forward from my experience and it's mainly been around budgetary issues and also around the bonkers um, idea that you know these young people not all of them but most and certainly in the schools I've worked in they've got access to these devices that do amazing things and if we don't capture that and use that then you know I don't really know what what we're doing can I just probe a little deeper there, David, because you said something very interesting about the behaviours behind the device. And I know from a lot of conversations with many schools about, you know, either one to one implementation with um, devices and or bring a variety of different devices to school, that there is a, a great fear around the safety of the child using that device when in class and at school that one, they might use it inappropriately or two, they might be accessing information that they shouldn't be looking at so how do you best manage that so in a way that people embrace the learning and the use of the devices well i think first of all um, those concerns are, are well grounded in terms of you know is our responsibility to manage the safety however i don't subscribe to the fact of blocking is the way forward i think responsible use because the thing is about blocking and that point of view is it kind of goes from the assumption that all kids are evil and feral and so therefore if we give a little bit of freedom to all of our kids they will all turn into these monsters the fact of the matter is is that those that have access to this have access as soon as they're out of school anyway first of all so what are we doing to kind of model the appropriate use of these technologies and what we're we doing to kind of uh, improve young people's digital literacy and understanding of the damage they can do to themselves using mobile devices and and the other is kind of you know that's just not true most young people can be trusted and most young people take the right choices and you know I just I'm just not a pessimist when it comes to young people. The other thing is, is that, you know, in the schools I've worked in, we've had school wide Wi-Fi because, you know, again, although most children have um, because parents don't want to run up massive bills, they have unlimited data, which is great. Um, but through our Wi-Fi network here, all the same sites that are filtered and blocked are same filtered and blocked on a mobile device. Really, those children that are going to bully and those children that are going to have Facebook issues will have those issues whether you use the devices or not. And I think schools should take control of that. And, you know, we educate our staff each year and we kind of, um, you know, talk to our children all the time and we speak to our children and say, right, what what social media is going on at the moment? What, what are the nasty ones? What do we need to know about? What do we need to be saying? And then it's about having conversations with young people and ha coming up with some simple rules. And and quite simply, the last two schools I've been involved with the B BYOD is the students that have written the policy um, and they've taken ownership over it. And, you know, it, from that, although there are incidents of uh, of kind of um, cyber bullying and things like that, I'm not convinced that that's because we allow devices in schools. I think in the old days, those students would have been involved in bullying in other ways, really. And if anything, it's easier to track, it's easier to respond to, and it's easier to address. And do you have any examples that you can share with us of 
good practice that you've seen of using the devices in class? Yeah, I think there's um, there's loads. I mean, I'll go back to kind of the first one because uh, what I did at, at, at my primary school is that you know we sat down with the students, they wrote the policy, and they did all of the um, the research. They spoke to governors, teachers, the whole lot, and they came up with six bullet points basically, and that was the policy. And it's still in place now, and in fact, it's still in place in this school in with a couple of tweaks. And I always remember that if I ranked from one at the top who was the most open to handheld technology to you know hundred at the hundredth teacher at the bottom who was completely anti it I, you know i found out about things where you know a french teacher had just simply asked uh, one student to read out his, his number in french and then someone else on the other side of the room just typed that in and pressed dial and to see if the phone rang um and that was that it was kind of you know and that really simple and effective thing adds another dimension to what's going on really another really good practice is um i i really don't like students taking photographs of the homework or the board that's just mad you know just put it on slideshare or put it on the school website and things but um you know i've seen staff going through and go right it's your homework so get out your calendar function go to the date put it in right this is how you set a reminder for yourself and to me that's good practice for work that's what i do you know it's a, the double diary entry kind of thing because that's teaching skills to help them get organized really and i'm just don't i've never have subscribed to the digital natives idea um i think young people are brilliant consumers of um technology and we do have some amazing uh, students that i work with that have use and created using digital media but most of them don't have a clue what most of the stuff does on their phone and that's where we can come in and you know because because once the you know the iphone came along and it transformed how i work and now i'm a lot more organized just because i've got less paper and i've got reminders and you know all bits and pieces like that i mean even to the point where I recently was showing just on the computer, not even on a on a device, just on the computer, that Microsoft has the access to convert your written text on your computer screen to speak. So any child can then access any worksheet. But they didn't know this, and it's the most simple device on your computer that is available to everybody. So I, I totally agree with you. I don't think they are completely comfortable with how to use all of these devices and i think that's something that we should be responsible for absolutely and i think you know some of the biggest impact i see about these devices are with our most vulnerable and most needy students in terms of you know those with um send those that are pupil premium and you know there's some very very simple free or very cheap apps that can absolutely revolutionize what's going on in terms of screen sharing for those who are visually impaired you know a recording function to capture everything that's there um you know even from feedback like you know i believe that digital exercise books exist at the moment if you use OneNote um in microsoft and if everyone had a device you know i can sit there with that student's piece of work and i can be narrating and talking about the feedback and just touching the screen of that relevant bit and then it can be all it's automatically shared in some skydrive or google docs whatever it is but then that student can then decide when they want to work on that and, and pick it up and they know exactly what the feedback is. And it's about, you know, what you talking about workload. If you had the investment in that sort of technology and the training, then that will save time and it will improve feedback. And and it's really important that when we talk about, you know, being able to work anywhere, any time, it's not teachers being on call 24 7 it's just the fact that instead of sitting in your classroom i can go and sit out on the field and actually maybe do a bit of feedback there or you know i've got a bit of dead time so i can just you know mark a little bit more now and i think you know the potential really hasn't been fully realized mainly because investment is all about catching up with curriculum change instead of investing in technology so it sounds like you very much get people voice involved in your policy making. So I'd just quite like to get from you a few things, if that's OK, David. So what would you say has been the best use of apps that you have seen? Because you said that you're using them with vulnerable children. So what would you recommend as the best apps in a learning environment using devices? 
to me, the, as I say, that the main generally the main criteria is that um, it's freely available, it's multi-platform, and so therefore, you know, things like OneNote, Evernote, Dropbox, um, and those kind of things are really, really useful. I've seen Photobabble used really, really well because you know you can take a picture, the student can re record audio, and then that's across multi-platform. Um, and really, for me, those those are the starting points, you know, and and they are the most important. And and then when you look at things like, you know, MindNode or or these specialist apps, like they're all OK, but I'm still not convinced they add anything that making a mind map on paper wouldn't give. It's like, yeah, you can share them, but can you collaborate on them and, and can you add some information? And I think, you know, those to me are the most exciting. And then uh, when we look at our kind of... Um, you know, personalised learning department, they're using things like uh, dragging dictate and sort of... Um, desktop sharing software and apps that allow the, the students sort of have on their device in front of them what the teacher is showing and then they can screen grab that or stop it or write on it or you know and be helped and and then that means that the students can access all of that from home as well. Wow that's so exciting and I, I just love how you're getting the pupils involved in it so I'm very interested to find out have you done any evaluation with your pupils as to how they have valued the feedback teachers have been giving them using those devices. Yeah, we haven't here yet. Um, at my previous school, uh, we had, and it was generally positive. But the thing is, is that it's when it's appropriate. So, you know, it, it's not um, a substitution from that live verbal feedback from the teacher or that little intervention that's just at the right time. But I know that the quality of feedback increases and, you know, classes that have, have gone for this whole scale have made more progress over time. If you push me and said, you know, is it essential? You know, I would say it adds value, definitely. And, you know, if it, if it is it essential for kind of driving up achievement, I don't think it is. But it does make things a lot easier and it does improve the workloads for the teacher. And if you're doing that, the teacher's got enough time to plan a bit more and perhaps to get to know their students a bit better. And so that, that for me is, is the potential, really. And also, we're getting all of these pupils ready to go into the workforce and employers are always saying that, you know, they have these students that have got all these amazing qualifications, but they don't know how to interact with people or how to answer a phone or how to, like you said, use a calendar. So these are vital life skills that we're teaching them. Absolutely. And it's, it's just like, um, you know, how many students actually know how to collect an award or how to say hello properly with a good handshake and eye contact and a confident sort of how are you or good morning. Um, you know, and, and for me, the most exciting practice are those that, look, this is what you need to produce. Do it in the most appropriate way. I don't care how you do it, but I want to see the, the result. And then the student's got to select what they've got to do, uh, then they've got to select the most appropriate way of communicating that. And yes, at the end of the day, they've got to sit down and engage with a written exam. And, you know, we can't do anything about that at the moment. We've got to deal with that. But from my experience, engaging students in uh, technology and essentially transforming information. So I've had students that have made RSA style animations and then use that. They've created a revisions resource at the same time, and that's led to better writing and better exam results as a result and you know it's that process of the student deciding right this is the task or the problem I've been set right I, I obviously know that I need to know the knowledge and I need to communicate my understanding and I need to use the correct terminology but how am I going to do that in the most appropriate way and so even today my year eight uh, we're, we're looking at extreme environments and we're looking at mountains and I said I want to know about Everest and I want you to communicate it to me in the most appropriate way. And we've had enough time now for you to be able to decide and choose what that is. And therefore, they're making the decision. It's really empowering them to learn, isn't it? It's putting the ball back in their court to make the decisions as to how they're going to go and find out that information. And by doing that, it leaves a, I think it leaves a stronger memory trace in their minds so that when you're going back over topics and you say, right, do you remember when we did this? It kind of reinforces that learning a bit more. So what we're going to do, David, we're just going to pop onto our inspiration round in just a moment, but very much said about having pupil voice in that policy decision. So you said there were five or six points that they came up with. Can you just quickly summarise for our listeners what those five points were? 
Yeah, um, this, this is off the top of my head, and you can, if you search on my blog, uh, the mobile at Priory project, you'll find it. But essentially, one, it was you turn up with the device away and the headphones away. Number two, it's up to the person who's in charge of that lesson whether or not you use them. Otherwise, you assume they're away. You don't take any images of people. Three, the apps have got to be free, so the teacher can't expect um children to sort of download anything and um, I think the others were, were around the fact of you know if you see anything and towards you report it and you know you're responsible for your own device basically. That's fantastic David thank you so much for sharing that with us so what we're going to do now is move on to our inspiration round and it's a way of getting some more value from you and you providing us with your best uh, educational resources and advice and, and things that you think could help other people in their practice. I really like to shine the light on you and really kind of go to what your proudest moment is because I think teachers do a phenomenal job in the classroom every day and I think we just need to give them a voice. So what is your proudest moment that you can share with us, please? This is uh, fairly tricky, really, because, you know, there's everyday simple things that are always really good. But I think, you know, the two that stand out for me um, because, you know, children are very important and the learners are very important, but the learners are also the staff. Um, and the staff are very important too. And, and I think the two proudest moments is seeing the students who got involved with projects from all sorts of backgrounds. Like we had um, a lad who was on Super Nanny, for example, um, stand up at teach meets and share what they've done. And I hadn't checked that. They just did it, or, you know, and, and they, they rose to the challenge. And, and just them putting things together and seeing them make the change in the school and seeing their policy in practice, really. And then the other thing is really, you know, the staff that I, I work with, especially at Priory Geography, have gone on and they're still kind of forging ahead and they have that that kind of mentality that, you know, we're here to kind of make a difference. And that's that's why we're here. Now, let's move on to the best advice you've ever received. And that is probably either in a teaching practice or it could be something uh, as you've moved through leadership. So please, can you share that with our listeners? Yeah, again, um, sort of loads of great advice, really. I've benefited from the advice of others um, always. If I go back to the earliest uh, advice, it was all about, you know, you can annoy anyone in a school, but don't annoy, you know, the heads PA, the back office staff versus the caretakers and the people that support the school and make it happen, really. And, And that came in, you know, when we were doing the BYOD device and we chalk graffitied the whole school, the only people we told about it were the caretakers because we knew they would be the people who might have to clear it up. Um, and that was a great piece of advice because it's about remembering the names of the receptionists and it's about sending a little handwritten postcard to say thank you, um, you know, to the TAs who've come along on your trip or whoever it is. And I think it's it sort of, you know, um, schools can't function without those admin staff. And sometimes they're relatively low paid and, you know, they might be part time and things and, and they come in and get on. And then the other thing is basically the colleague who, who basically said to me, you know, you've got to un- unlock the little boy that wants to get on and do things really and um you know it it was just sort of the jfdi which is just get on and do it basically and and do the right thing if if you think it's the right thing to do and as long as it's safe and as long as it's not illegal it's not inappropriate it's kind of get on and do it and it's kind of ask for forgiveness afterwards once you've got those results and you've shown the difference you can make rather than ask for permission because you know the thing is with um with teachers i think we're always waiting for superman to turn up and save us whether it's the next government or it's a different slt or if only i work for a better head of department or you know well next year when I've got a better class and that's just all rubbish you know it's just teachers that are holding ourselves back and if we just crack on and do it and come up with a really strong vision of ourselves and what teaching can be then I believe we can do anything we want to and we can go against the government because we'll have the the outcomes that will back us up and we'll say look whatever you're saying is wrong because we've got the results. 
And if you think about it, a teacher has a lot of power. They spend all day, every day, in a classroom with 30 plus children in front of them. That's a lot of power. That's like leading your own company. That's motivating all those individuals on a daily basis. So they should feel empowered to make those decisions because ultimately that's where the learning's happening. Absolutely. So what we're going to move on to now then, David, is your personal sources of inspiration. You know, for me, and uh, I think teachers are a bit like priests and we kind of lose our our faith every now and again and, and kind of, you know, some leave the profession and some do other things. And all of that is, is good and it's personal choices. But the people that really inspire me are the people that come in and get on and do so in, you know, quite adverse conditions and are still there in the classroom and still in the schools because they believe that actually, no, we can make a difference here. And they're delivering high quality teaching and learning. They're doing everything that's asked of them uh, and more. And they're still managing to kind of have those relationships with with other staff and professionals and with the young people. And they still manage to kind of get out of bed in the morning and come in because they think, you know, if I'm there, then that's going to make a difference especially when everyone's got a cold and in the midst of winter and it's dark and everyone's like no this is just such hard work when people are coming in and tackling difficult situations it's just everyone should have an award in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so let's move on to a teaching habit or it could be a leadership habit that works for you time and again i, I think really it's the power of routines if i'm talking about um some examples you know if you take behavior for example it's a massive distraction because it's the big personal thing but but behavior is important because if you get that right it sets the tone and the expectation and so when I work with teachers you know we focus for a lot around the first 10 minutes of the lesson you know how do you greet them at the door how do you get them to line up you know is there something to crack on straight away is it hard work you know, simple ideas like banned words, not allowing right from that first lesson when you see them, they're not allowed to write stuff, things, it's, you, um, you know, they've got to use technical terms uh, and bits and pieces. And I think, you know, you can really raise expectations by that. And, you know, I I've never been a subscriber of the performance lesson. I think, you know, it's anyone can knock out a brilliant lesson. Um, but actually to do the right thing day in, day out and do the simple things. So, that's important, I think. And I really I see it every day when I go into classes and I know that, you know, that teacher always expects them to work in this way. Never will accept work that isn't <clears throat> written properly um, and is you know, not even underlined that, you know, underlining and neat handwriting is important. It's just that that's the expectation that the little things matter. So then the bigger things matter even more. Um, and it sets that tone. I see so many comments from teachers where behaviour seems to be if we had like a top 10 of issues that affect teachers, behaviour is probably one of the biggest and even that low level clicking your pen or tapping the table or whispering to your friends that's behavioral problems but what would you say has worked for you and I know it's different depending on what school you're in and the dynamics of the class but what have you always fallen back on that has really helped you through some difficult times? For me it's my own personal philosophy of what learning and education is and I, I think I'm here to allow students to be able to make a difference, which to me means making an impact on their environment and being able to make informed choices in the future, as well as get the qualifications um, and everything else, really. And I think really when you've got that, it's quite easy to sail through the storms that are coming along because it's like, you know, is this going to make a difference to learning? How is this going to help staff make a difference to learning? And those two things are really important. And the thing is, is that I've been told time and time again that, oh, you know, pens. Oh, well, we give out pens here because, you know, well, we always do. And it's the school. And again, it's waiting for Superman. And I don't give out pens. And the students know I don't give out pens. And I might give them a pen for half an hour of their time. And just that simple thing, you know, if you expect it, they'll deliver it. And they know that. And actually, when you speak to students, that's what they like. They like the clear boundaries and they like being actually, you know, no, if you're not if you don't have a pen, you're not ready to learn. And that comes back, you know, to bring your own devices and, and anything else, really, is that if you don't have the presence of mind and the responsible attitude that you bring these things along um, and you don't do things like homework and it's not followed up, then how are you expected to really 
you know, do brilliantly elsewhere. And it's all about those habits. I totally agree. Thank you for sharing that with us, David. Now, can you just move on with us to a resource or a internet website that people could go to that you think would add value to them? Yeah, I think it, um, Starfroom, which is starfroom.io, is, is kind of, for me, um, it's been around almost for a year now, and I was asked to kind of get involved fairly early on. And, um, you know, the idea is, is it's it's like a staff room. You, you dip in and out and you share ideas. And um, and it's really nice. The community is growing and um, it's very supportive at the moment. And there's lots of inspiration. There's lots of sort of, lots of, sort of thought shrapnel. Um, and there's a lot of interaction. And the great thing is, is that if you're not a blogger, you know, it's an easy way to get into blogging because, you know, you don't have to worry about the platform or anything else you can just get on there write 500 words or less and share it and we'll put all that in your show notes so all of our listeners downloading this episode can find the link directly to that site so thank you for sharing that with us david so we're coming to the end of the show so what i would like to do is thank you so much for your time today it has been so helpful to me because bring your own device is a real issue that we're kind of looking into at my school so thank you so much for all of your advice and from my listeners point of view i know they will value it before we say goodbye if our listeners would like to connect with you and explore some of the issues of the podcast in more detail sort of go on to my blog which is um davidrogers.org.uk you can find me on staff room as well um tweet me at david e rogers and so yeah get in touch thank you for joining us today on inspiration for teachers for more resources tips and advice visit our website inspirationforteachers.com if you enjoyed today's episode we would love to connect with you just click like on our facebook page at facebook.com slash inspiration for teachers 